I would just like to introduce Jenny Long to you before we have our videos. much Claudia and I also would like to acknowledge that we are here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. It always was and always will be Gadigal land um, and we should remember that and do that not just as a protocol that we do at the beginning of things um, but also make some kind of commitment to do something small, whether it be share something on the internet, whether it be um, show a level of solidarity to our First Nations brothers and sisters in their struggle for an ongoing justice, treaties and sovereignty in this country. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and I want to start with, I guess, what would be an apology. Is to I like to consider myself as a member for Newtown and a member of the Greens as someone that's like ahead of the curve when you know about campaigns and you know about things that are coming. I like to think that um, I'm on top of that stuff. And I would have to say that I am not on top of this at all. And so I want to say I'm really sorry, but I have been making the office get on top of it in the last week. I chatted to Scott Ludlam on Monday night and clearly our former Green Senator for WA is onto it and gets it. And he was telling me what I should do to get on top of it. And Jordan Still John, who is <laughs> John, who replaced him in the Senate, has put out a Greens comprehensive plan which is committed to the idea of putting 15 million into federal research, medical research. <laughs> I am truly horrified by and partly it's because I just can't comprehend the idea that we say that we have universal health care and we talk up Medicare as this amazing thing that looks out for everyone and it's not about your ability to pay to be able to access health care is just the complete, um, I think, gobsmacking reality that MECFS is not actually included on the list of NDIS. Um, accessible in terms of the people suffering being able to access it, but the other side of it being just the failure to recognise the support that is needed to people. And I was chatting to someone outside, I didn't check that this was okay to share it so I won't say her name, but I was chatting to someone outside and I think part of it is this idea that it just does not work. If people are, are highly educated and can't keep a job because they are ill and they are sick, it's not reasonable to send them to new start to say you should go and apply for some random job a certain number of times a month because that's actually avoiding the whole purpose, right? Because the whole purpose is that people that are suffering in this situation are sick and so they can't get a job. They need support. They don't need the government to say the only way that you're going to be able to live and survive is if you go and tick these boxes of a system that actually is set up to make you be put off by it so that you are exhausted by it and you don't want to engage with it. And that is for people that are in full health that actually are exhausted by that as an issue. And so I think the other part that I would say is that I know that the Greens are ad committed to advocating for, um, for inclusion in the NDIS, but also in addition to that, I think that hearing really badly and hearing your experience, Jade, and, and going to now go into um, do a PhD on the subject and push this is the fact that there's just so little awareness around this. And so when you're looking at education, and I would give you, I guess what I would say is a something that I was witnessed recently that I feel like is a really positive story of hope to share is that, and it actually is completely on a, on a side tangent, but shows the need to educate our medical professions on issues. And it was actually an amazing report done by ACON, who's the old AIDS Council of New South Wales. Um, and they did it with transgender and gender diverse young people about what education they thought GPs and doctors needed to be able to support them. Because basically most of the doctors and GPs and medical professionals and healthcare workers that had gone through their education had never been provided with any awareness or any education to be able to provide any support. And so they actually brought together a group of people with a whole series of recommendations of what was required. And so I think, Jay, your example about what is needed here, but also recognising that this isn't about how people are advocating for themselves, but actually what is required in terms of investing in research that then shows that this is something that needs to be taken seriously, such that there is the necessary education. So with medical research, we know that then 
medical professionals, the health professionals will then engage in understanding that in more detail because it's given a level of credibility because large amounts of money are put into that medical research that then assists them to re-educate and train themselves in such a way to be able to provide support. The other two things that I wanted to touch on briefly is the idea of how hard it is in general for people to be able to afford to live in our city. And the fact that if you are looking at a scenario in the area of Newtown where we are now, 50% of people rent. Now, renting is an insecure form of housing at the best of the time. It's also very expensive. The likelihood is that the next generation of folks that are coming up are actually unlikely to be able to afford their own home ever. And so rental markets are a huge issue. And we're looking at people that actually are not being provided with the necessarily, necessary financial and social support, let alone the medical and health support, then that has huge ramifications for people's ability to function in society, even if they are in a really, really strong state. But the real challenge and the real factor we see is that what we want to see in our society is things like public housing being able to be there, not as something that you have to be on a 10 year waiting list for, but something that provides you with a safe and secure place to live, such that if you are sick, you are able to access public housing and know that you can live in that housing, it's good quality housing, it's able to be able to live there and support and you pay it as a percentage of your income. So if your income is less, because you are not well and you're unable to work, then you're not kicked out of your home and you don't lose and face in addition to all of the other challenges you're facing, housing and security. The final thing I want to say is that I just think that I have been feeling a lot like there's something really wrong with the fact that our society requires the people that are vulnerable and in these situations to have to advocate and raise the voices of themselves when they're actually in a scenario where they're not in a position to do that. And I, I say it not with a sense of hopelessness about it, but with a sense of creating solidarity across the Millions Missing movement, but on so many other issues. For too long, people have said it should be the people that are silenced or marginalised or removed from society should be the ones speaking up and advocating for themselves to get people to pay attention because we work in a way that the, the loudest voices, the strongest campaigns, the biggest movements of people are the ones that get the most attention. But if you can't get out of bed, if you're too scared to be able to go somewhere because you're marginalised for other reasons in society, if you're in a situation where you are actually sick and suffering because you don't get the support you need, it is unfair of us as a society to say, well, no one knows about it because you're not doing enough to raise it. No one knows about it because you're not out there, you know, meeting with MPs and campaigning on the street or writing petitions or doing whatever. And why aren't you out there lobbying and running fundraisers and doing whatever you can to be able to raise it? Well, I think the onus is the other way around. Governments are aware of this. Governments are aware of the challenges around this. They know that people are not supported. And they know the size and the scale of the problem. I mean, you just look at the hashtag, Millions Missing is not a, a snappy hashtag because it sounds good. Like we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in Australia and a failure to put this on the NDIS and we're talking about millions of people around the world. And the onus should be on governments to look after people and to care for them. So I'd like to end by saying that I really thank Claudia and everyone else for inviting me to be a part of this. I, I acknowledge and respect and pay tribute to my Greens colleagues who have been putting this on the agenda and can give you my assurance now that in addition to the 15 million that Adam Ban announced that we wanted to see into medical research, that I will add my voice to that. Um, and I also <laughs> say... that you think that actually could work to assist in terms of state government issues and reforms, then I encourage you to get in touch. Claudia, Claudia knows how to get in touch with us, but it is something that I think a lot of MPs are just, like myself, not aware of what needs to be done and how we can help. The Greens now have a plan for that, so I have a roadmap for where we go, but you clearly also have clear ideas of what is needed, and it's your voices that we should be putting out there, and please know that I've now got this as a thing. You don't need to go to more effort to petition me to get me to pay attention. <laughs> I'm now on your side. You guys should just look after yourselves and let us try and push them to do what they need to do. So thank you so much for allowing me to be